In every discussion of climate change, there's one number that comes up repeatedly, 1.5 degrees Celsius. We're supposedly aiming to prevent climate heating exceeding this level, but given that temperatures have already risen by 1.26 degrees, and given the state of international climate action, surely we need to be real about this goal. In this video, I'm going to look at this target with a critical eye. Is it possible? Absolutely. Is it likely? That's a different story. Lots of people are starting the new year with resolutions. It could be to get fitter, to give up drinking, to be kinder to people, or maybe it could be to limit climate warming to a safe level. 1.5 degrees is considered safe. It's certainly not ideal, because, well, no level of climate change is ideal, but keeping warming to 1.5 degrees would allow us to avoid the most serious and long-lasting consequences of climate change. Self-help gurus will tell you that New Year's resolutions, or goals in general, are often broken because they're not smart. And by that, I mean specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. So, is the 1.5 degree target smart? Let's find out. First, is the target specific? What do we mean by 1.5 degrees? 1.5 first appeared seriously on the global stage in 2015 in the Paris Agreement, de Paris pour le est which aims to limit global average temperature rise to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial temperatures and to pursue efforts to limit warming to 1.5. It's like a stretch target on a GoFundMe. But the Paris Agreement didn't specify what is meant by either global average temperature or pre-industrial. It may sound pedantic, but this is where being specific is really important. Firstly, what's global average temperature? Land warms faster than the ocean, and the Earth's surface is 70% ocean. So taking only land temperatures would mean that the 1.5 degree target was met faster than if we considered temperatures across the entire surface. Most definitions use land and ocean temperatures, and the major combined temperature data sets that are most commonly used all measure land and ocean, and all show that we are creeping perilously close to our target. Secondly, what does pre-industrial mean? The period you compare against, also known as a baseline, can have a considerable impact on the calculated rate of warming. If you assume the baseline was warmer, then it will take longer to reach 1.5 degrees. The baseline is usually taken to be 1850 to 1900, because although the Industrial Revolution got started a lot earlier than this, it didn't start to take off everywhere until the mid-1800s, so the warming caused in those early years was pretty minimal. And besides, we have much more reliable temperature measurements from around about 1850. So, if we're being specific, this target is to limit global average land and ocean surface temperature change to 1.5 degrees Celsius in comparison to the average for 1850 to 1900. Whew, and that, my friends, is why it gets abbreviated. <laughs> Great, now we've got that sorted, how do we know when we've breached the 1.5 degree threshold? Is it measurable? Temperature data comes from weather stations all over the globe, as well as from weather balloons, ships, planes, and satellites. But we don't have equal coverage of every corner of the globe, and temperature observations in some parts of the world, like the poles and Africa, are pretty sparse. And to make things more complicated, when we divide the planet into regular latitude-longitude boxes, as many of the data sets do, the size of those boxes shrinks as we get closer to the poles, because Mapping 2D space onto a sphere is famously a headache. The people who produce datasets like HadCrew and GISTemp, which I showed in this graph, deal with this missing data differently. That's why each of the datasets has a subtly different record. Regardless of that though, the headline message is the same. We are edging closer and closer to 1.5 degrees every day. But you might be thinking, haven't we already reached one and a half? 2023 was the first time that global average temperatures rose to two degrees above average, and we were one and a half degrees above average for a full third of the days in 2023. But these are short-term variations, and to properly determine where we are in relation to the baseline, we need to take a longer average, typically 20 years. The average is centered on a particular year, taking into account the 10 years either side, which means that we will only know for sure that we have reached 1.5 degrees 10 years after we've passed it, which isn't much use. To get around this, a bunch of UK Met Office scientists suggested in a recent paper that we can use a combination of observed temperature rise and future model projections. They calculate the current level of temperature rise, averaging the previous 10 years of measurements with the next 10 years of model simulations. And their analysis shows that 2022 was at 1.26 degrees C. 
It's a clever way of doing it that would give us more warning and allow us to see temperature change in near real time. That will be crucial because estimates suggest that we won't have long to wait before we reach the threshold. This is a critical decade. Human-induced global warming rates are at their highest historical level, and 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming might be expected to be reached or exceeded within the next 10 years in the absence of cooling from major volcanic eruptions. Okay, so obviously this is the part we all care about the most. Is 1.5 achievable? We're currently sitting a quarter of a degree away from this dangerous warming threshold. And as summarized by the UN Environment Programme's Emissions Gap Report for 2023, we're on track for double that by 2100, with predictions of just under three degrees, or at best two and a half degrees, if every country actually comes through on its emissions commitments and pledges. I did an end of year roundup on Sky News with the fantastic Freddie Otto recently, and she said something that perfectly captures the problem of climate change. 1.5 alive? Well, yes, if you ask me as a physicist, absolutely. If you ask me as part of this society, it's, it, is, um, it is looking ever more difficult. Yeah, what she said. If this were just a physical environmental problem, it would be relatively easy to fix. But the thing is, it's not. Climate change is a very human problem. We have structured our societies, especially in industrialized countries, around resource extraction and fossil fuels. Everything around you depends on this, from the energy used to heat and cool our homes, to the ways we travel, to the resources used to build our roads, offices and apartments, to the metals and plastics that are all around us, to the electricity that powers the device you're watching this video on. All of it depends to some greater or lesser extent on the extraction of natural resources and the burning of fossil fuels. To stop using these resources overnight would be virtually impossible. But we have alternatives, we have the technology and we have the roadmaps to get where we need to be. The only thing that's really holding back this transformation is people. Part of the problem is one of imagination. We can't see beyond our current worldview to see that there are limitless opportunities and possibilities to transform our economies and societies without sacrificing living standards. And in fact, there will be so many benefits to shifting to a more sustainable and climate-friendly world, not least the avoidance of immense human suffering dealt out directly by climate disasters. But the majority of the problem is the people in charge. And at risk of straying out of my lane as a scientist, I think it's pretty obvious that the way we're currently doing things isn't working. Our political systems prioritize the status quo because it keeps power and influence in the hands of people in charge. And that's really holding back our attempts to disrupt things and do things differently. Because making it to one and a half will mean doing things very differently. It means electrifying everything, energy generation, transport, manufacturing, stopping the destruction of natural environments like forests, cutting emissions of other greenhouse gases like methane, and sucking up and storing carbon from the atmosphere directly using carbon removal technology. It's a tough road, and lots of people with interest in keeping things as they are will tell you that climate action comes with too high a price tag. But here's where they're wrong. Another way to evaluate our goal is whether it's relevant, and there could hardly be a more relevant goal. Climate change is the most existential threat to humanity. It amplifies existing inequalities, it screws the economy, it decimates biodiversity, it spreads disease, and it generally makes life a lot harder for most people on the planet. Fighting climate change isn't about protecting the environment at the cost of human existence. Fighting climate change is about saving ourselves. Here's a reminder of what's at stake. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a special report on 1.5. And it found that there are massive differences between the severity of climate impacts at 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. Let's take some examples. At 1.5, we will lose three quarters of coral reefs, which are some of the most incredible and biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. At 2 degrees, we will lose 99% of them. An already enormous loss will be made a lot worse. Biodiversity loss is a serious problem whichever group of animals or plants you look at. The number of species lost is two or three times higher at 2 degrees compared to 1.5 degrees, pretty much across the board, threatening ecosystems, food systems and natural resilience. Arctic sea ice is another big one. At 1.5 degrees, we can expect to see a summer free of Arctic sea ice once in a century. At 2 degrees, that increases to once a decade. 
a once in a lifetime event becomes 10 times more likely. That's going from something that happens about as often as England wins the World Cup to something that happens as often as the census. And before you start to think these impacts don't directly affect people, there's a huge difference in the number of people exposed to life-threatening heat. At one and a half degrees, 14% of the world's population will experience extreme heat at least once every five years, whereas at two degrees, this number rises to 37%. That's more than a third of the world's eight billion people. One thing we haven't talked about yet is time. We've defined our target, sure, but when do we need to meet it by? Most definitions refer to temperature change at the end of the century, but there are a lot of years between now and then, and there are a lot of ways to get there. Scientists and economists produce 1.5 degree scenarios that map out how we might get to our target by the end of the century. But even these scenarios, which appear wildly unachievable in our current political climate, only give us a 66% chance of keeping warming below 1.5 degrees. That means that there's still a one in three chance that warming will be greater than that. Every pathway shows that the sooner we act, the less painful it will be to reach 1.5 degrees. If we had started in 2000, the transition would have been so much easier than if we start today. Every second that we waste, the challenge gets harder. Obviously, the best time for action was 40 years ago, but the next best time is now. But, some sneaky politician will say, nobody said we couldn't go above 1.5 for a bit and then bring it back down again. And yeah, that's true. Lots of pathways involve some level of overshoot, where temperatures temporarily exceed 1.5 degrees and then come back down. This is a risky business because the longer we stay above 1.5, the greater the risk of wreaking lasting damage to the climate system by triggering tipping points or completely destroying critical ecosystems, for example. And remember, it's still not 100% guaranteed that a 1.5 degree scenario will get us to 1.5 degrees by 2100. Overshoot scenarios make a lot of assumptions. And in fact, there are a lot of underlying assumptions in all of these scenarios. One, they don't take into account the uncertainty about how the physical system will respond and assume that the climate system will just respond as it always has done so far, which isn't actually a given. Two. Most 1.5 degree pathways assume significant population decline, which really isn't what we're seeing. And three, all of them rely heavily on negative emissions technology to remove carbon directly from the atmosphere. These technologies are nowhere near ready to be deployed on the scale that would be required. So given all of this, you might be thinking that it's time to give up on the 1.5 degree target. It sure ain't smart, but I'm gonna try and convince you why we shouldn't. Personally, I don't think we're gonna make it. And with the weight of evidence, I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. Scientists focus on 1.5 because it's still theoretically possible, and it ain't over till it's over, as they say. To give up before it becomes impossible would be disingenuous. But given that this is a human problem, not a physical one, I struggle to see how we will limit global average surface temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. I don't think we should give up on 1.5 though for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's still technically possible, and who knows, maybe we can pull off a miracle. None of us can see the future, and while 1.5 is still possible, I'm not ready to call it quits yet. We have models to project scenarios, but models are terrible at predicting human behavior and random events in the climate system. And if we've learned anything from COVID, it's that unpredictable events can have a world-changing impact. Secondly, it's never too late for action. There's a lot to lose, and if pushing for 1.5 means we are more ambitious in our attempts to limit warming, then so be it. I'll take 1.8 degrees over 2.5 any day. Because, as I always say, every tenth of a degree of warming matters. Whether or not we make 1.5 degrees is in some ways irrelevant, because we should be doing everything we can to limit warming regardless. Every fraction of a degree we avoid means hundreds of thousands of lives saved. 1.5 degrees is slipping out of reach. It's not yet impossible, but it's looking increasingly unlikely. But that is no reason to give up. 1.5 degrees is just a political target after all. There are no hard lines in the sand that mean 1.51 degrees is infinitely worse than 1.49 degrees. But every increment of warming makes a difference. A lot of you ask me why I'm so optimistic, and I wouldn't necessarily say that I am. Enthusiastic? Yes but I see myself as a pragmatist rather than an optimist. I sit somewhere in the gray area between toxic positivity and nihilistic doomism. 
There's always space to make things better while accepting that some things will get worse. We have to go into this discussion with our eyes wide open and be brave. So with that in mind, I'd argue that it's not yet time to give up on 1.5. But the target is almost irrelevant because we have to do everything to disrupt the way we do things and accelerate climate action. There's no other option. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. If you want to watch more videos about why 1.5 makes sense as a target, check out this video over here. And if you're a fan of these videos, you can help me make more of them by becoming a supporter on Patreon. My fantastic subscribers allow me to spend more time creating these videos and developing the channel. All right, till next time.